Welcome to the King's Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, your King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. Joining me, ABC 10's Sean Cunningham. Sean, what's going on? This is take two, so everyone knows. Take two. Take two. two. James has a weird uh, block. Everyone does. block. And you know what, James? Everyone does because we used to be News 10 for the longest time. Yeah. And just it's it's a legacy thing. People remember News 10. And yeah, we haven't been News 10 for a long time. And my bosses who fortunately listen to our podcast, they want us to make sure that we shout out ABC 10. Which is ABC we should, 10. So. Well, we just yeah. said ABC 10 14 times on the first time. So <laughs> I hope your bosses at ABC 10 are happy that we call this uh, the King's Beat podcast with Sean Cunningham's uh, with Sean Cummings. Sean Cunningham's plural. There's many from, of me. from ABC 10. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, it it's sometimes a, feels like there's many of me, to be honest, with yeah. some of these, the way the weeks have gone by. Um, yeah, it. <laughs> uh, this has been a long day. Uh, I, I don't if you you didn't follow all day long. And this is Tuesday. Um, I, I did a four hour stretch uh, on ESPN 1320 today with uh, Kenny Carraway. Um, Damian Barling had a day off, so. Uh, I've been in this chair for, I think probably like, we're probably pushing like five hours. I I got up like twice just to walk it off. But as a guy with a bad back, it's probably not the best idea to, to string along like five and a half, six hours of audio here. Uh, But we're here and we're doing it, Sean. We're doing it. We are committed to our jobs and that's, we're going to, we're going to see it through. And you were a trooper today. (laughs) We we are going to see it through. I I enjoy it. If nothing more, you deserve a hug. <laughs> How about a hug? How about a hug? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Austin Powers will live. Doctor Evil lives on in infamy even today. That's right. That's right. I was telling Sean. Uh, somehow, like my family has been locked upstairs for like the last since since before noon. Uh, that's a long day of being. And I went upstairs to check on everybody and. My uh, my 18 year old is in my wife and I's bedroom with the three dogs. They had TV on at one point. All four of them are laying there asleep on, you know, everyone's out. Uh, so, yeah, you, you do what you, you can do to get through. Right, Sean? The ham household might be up past midnight tonight with all the sleep they got during the day. <sighs> That's true. That puppy, that puppy is driving us bonkers. <laughs> she's, she's a sweet little thing, but my goodness forgetting that having a puppy is like having a baby in the house. Uh, all right. So we've got tons of Kings news, uh, I think. Or do we? Well, some of it's the same, like they lost, <laughs> <laughs> but some of it's different and partially the same, like they still want Ben Simmons. Uh, so, so, much, we, so much chatter. So much chatter, 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 chatter. Yeah, it is crazy chatter. All right. So let's get some of the business out of the way first. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up uh, and then subscribe. We're we're pushing. We, we want to get to uh, 8 million subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> Halfway there. <laughs> or, Living or, on a prayer. Or 1,000, whichever comes first. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, number two, if you're not a paid subscriber to The King's Beat, you should be because we're doing amazing things here and it's awesome. And everyone loves the podcast and you know, you should be part of the, the family, right, Sean? I agree, especially the happy hours, because those are good time. The happy hour, good times. Uh, we're already looking at early, uh, early February for the next happy hour. Um, somehow we're going to try to squeeze one in before the trade deadline. Uh, that is always risky. Oof, that is it, risky. It is risky because this thing could blow up at any time. I, you kind of feel like... This is like when uh, like Maxwell Smart reads the like the uh, his job for the day, and then it it's gonna blow up, right? Or mm-hmm. or this message will self destruct. Yeah, yeah. This message will self. That's this team is already self destructing, but I'm waiting for it to like twice blow up in our hands at like any time. I'm like, oh, oh. and severely maim us. Yes, <laughs> I smell burning. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I always dread this time because interacting with players is never really a fun time around the trade deadline because oftentimes we have to ask about the looming trade deadline and it's completely out of their control. But what today is a good example of that. I mean, 
before deer and fox got kicked out of that game against the 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 rockets on sunday he had made some comments that to yahoo mm-hmm. sports and chris haynes and obviously there was a little bit of traction there and i i you know i don't think that there was much damning anything really damning there but i wanted to ask some more questions about it today and i and i know we'll get into this a little bit later but i felt like okay how what's the tolerance level on thought with with fox going to be like even today here he is just days ago meeting with Chris Haynes and now he's got to go before some of us in the media who cover him on a regular basis. And I thought he, I thought he handled it very well. Now, what does this look like a week from now? And he hasn't been traded or whatever, or certain guys haven't been traded. Um, Yeah. It's always just kind of an uneasy time. Sean, I think that might be the strangest thing. Like let's start there. It's not even close to February 10th yet. Right. I mean, like we're still better part of a month away. Yeah, we're still, I mean, I, you know, we got, we got like 20 something days and this is crazy hot. Like it, mm-hmm. it's nothing but all day long. And I mean, that's not conducive to winning. Number one, like this thing, this dark cloud hanging over your head. Um, but you know, like this is tough. It, it is tough. And I think it's only going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, I, first of all, I want to play the audio, uh, of Fox that, that you had, um, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, we're not going to play the audio here, uh, just because it's, it's really difficult to cut in, uh, for me to cut in and get this thing posted quickly, but we're going to run the audio, um, on, on the other side, on, on the, the audio version of the pod of Fox's stuff. And then when I, uh, when I post the, uh, the video up on uh, the King's Beat, and you get your email if you're a subscriber. Um, I'll make sure that Sean's tweet with the video of Fox is in that. So if you're going to watch a YouTube video, uh, you can just go back to the tweet. I mean, to the the email and actually watch uh, watch Fox's reaction. But Sean, let's go let's go there first, and and let De'Aaron Fox kind of uh, tell us what what's going on with him mentally and and going through this process. Um, normally I would do something crazy, like make a bunch of noises so I can see it. So for you watching on YouTube, I'm just going to make a click. So it, it, uh, spikes in the, in the audio file. Cool. All right. So <laughs> the magic, cool. you just saw the magic of television. That's right. Boom. All of a sudden there's a video there. Um, Sean, I, I thought, you know, what he said to Chris Haynes, I think some of it was taken out of context and then ran with, which I, I thought was silly. Like that's the problem with aggregation, right? Uh, it's something that like, if you're, if you're a writer and you're in this today's day and age, it's so incredibly difficult to, you have editors who want you to write about something and, you know, they'll see a quote that's thrown out there. And then if you do any research on the quote at all, where did it come from? How did they get the quote? Is that the full quote? You end up stumbling onto like a quagmire of how do I, how do I write this, still have it be catchy, not blow another media member to pieces for parting out a quote or even incorrectly quoting somebody and, and still make it something that my bosses are going to be okay with. Luckily at, at the King's Beat, I don't, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not aggregating a bunch of quotes, but the way that Fox sort of said, like, if I'm here, I'm here. If I'm not, I'm not. That's what gets put out there. Do you want to be in Sacramento? Yeah, I want to be in Sacramento, but I don't know if I'm going to be here or not. They tell me that they're going to build around me, but they also tell me that there's a possibility that they can't build around me and that I've got to be the one that's traded. And that's kind of the way that his quotes went. I, that's why I've always been a real advocate of number one, your video, uh, your, or like my video, I, I like to put up mm-hmm. videos in their entirety, like, or at least, uh, quotes in their entirety when I do videos. Uh, but also when I do block quote someone, sometimes it's a long block quote. And, and some people are like, why do you, why do you quote like four or five lines? And it's because I want the, I want to be accurate. And I want to add the nuance and I want to add the content uh, context to what someone says with, and give them like, be respectful of what someone said to me. 
because I think that that's the biggest thing you want to make sure that, and then if someone cuts that quote up later and trashes it, there's nothing I can do about that, but at least I did my job. And so what did you feel like when you went in and you hit him with a bunch of questions afterwards? Yeah. Cause I, I really wanted to just see how, first of all, how he's internalizing it because everyone is different. And obviously we know uh-huh. Fox is a very different type of person. Uh, especially for being the perceived head of the snake and all that mumbo jumbo. Uh, But I really wanted to set him up in a way of here's how I'm digesting it. How do I deal with it? I go out and ball. I go out and ball. Um, It's not something he has control over. He wants honesty. He seeks and values the honesty from the front office. But then I said, look, it's not in your control. However, if it were, people know that you've had a loyalty to Sacramento people know that, you know, you've said you wanted to be here. If you had control of this, what, how would you want to see this played out? And the way he started to answer the question almost made my eyebrows go up because, and even though I'm wearing two masks in front of him, um, I, I he says, I want to win. I want to be part of a winning team. We're, we're continuing to build and work towards that. Now, I think some people will say he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. And I would tend to agree with you. I think that De'Aaron is at a part in his life where, Hey, if a trade happens, okay, great. Move on. He doesn't have the pressure of being the best player on the team. He'll still be paid handsomely, uh, but he'll go to maybe a fresh start, a new environment where the expectations will be a little bit different. I think he'd be open to it, particularly if it means being in a better winning culture that's around that that surrounds him because obviously right now that doesn't exist in Sacramento but the we are continuing to build and work towards that is an acknowledgement of I I I'm fine being here you know I, I'm I, I see the direction we're going but I understand that we are a losing team and they're going to do anything that's within their power to make this team better and if I'm here they're you know hopefully we're making that better but if I'm not I understand this is not a winning situation, so they're going to have to do everything that's within their power. So I think there have been honest discussions. I think to me, it was the most impactful comment that he made um, so far, even in his time here in Sacramento, when the trade deadline has come around, because I think he takes a little bit of responsibility for this team, not being better than they are. And I think he's keenly aware of that. I know he's spoken about that in the past saying that we need to, you know, we need to be better. We need to be better. So there is a hold yourself accountable, but I think that that two sentences or that, you know, that, that whole, I want to win. I want to be part of a winning team. We're continuing to build and work towards that is a very powerful statement from Fox. Yeah, he, he is different, right? Um, He's a guy that, you know, he got here in Sacramento when he was very young and, you know, a 19 year old guy. Now he's 24. Um, He's growing, he's growing into being, uh, really like the man who he's going to be not on the basketball court, uh, but off the court as well. Um, he's got a fiance who has taken to Twitter a lot to be, and, and is very defensive. Um, but at the same time, like I'll say this, like if the Kings were to make some pie in the sky trade, I wrote about it on Sunday. My Sunday musings was about how, how I would handle the Philadelphia 76ers trade, like, speculation if if i were gm for a day this is what i would do um and i think the point is to like if you're the kings and and they want you to take on tobias harris and they want you to take on ben simmons and you can do that without losing De'Aaron fox and without losing tyrese halliburton number one that's a stretch uh but i will tell you this if you can do that those are the two two best players he's ever played with in sacramento Instantly. That's it. Yeah. Instantly. It, that's it. Like that. He's never played with an all-star. He's never. And while Harrison Barnes and Tobias Harris, I don't think that there's a huge difference between them. Tobias Harris is still a better player. And, you know, he's a near all-star level player. He's paid like a uh, freaking eight time all-star and, you know, he makes twice as much. He's not worth what he's paid even remotely close. He's paid twice as much, more than twice as much as Harrison Barnes and not only that, but Harrison Barnes is under contract for one more year after this year at 18 million bucks. Tobias Harris is owed up like 77 million over the next two years. So you're realistically taking on like an additional 
almost $60 million uh, over two years to take on someone like Tobias. But that's why that deal makes sense. But to get back to the original point, because we're going to discuss that later, uh, it's that those would be the best players he's ever played with. And that's really not fair to judge somebody and say, like, how come you can't make this team better when that's who he's, I mean, those are the best players he's ever played with. Now, could Fox be better? Yes. Could he be more engaged this season very specifically? Yes. Things I hear behind the scenes, he's he's not as engaged in the team as he has been in the past. And that's a problem. And we've seen that play out on the court. But at the same time, like he does still want to be here. He wants the weight of 16 losing seasons or 15 losing seasons and and 10 games under 500 right now. It's heavy. It's heavy for everyone involved. Like it's heavy for Sean and I. Like it's not fun that the team that you cover loses all the time and never ever has like some positivity pushing forward. And it always feels like chaos and it always feels like the dark cloud. It, like really, it kind of feels like Charlie Brown, you know, <laughs> where like the, the dark cloud just follows you around and rains on you and no one else. Like that's not fun all the time to be under that. But at and the same let time, that, let me, let me take that a step further too. Yeah. Because it's, it's, as Fox pointed out earlier this year, he's like, no, I've won everywhere. I've won everywhere I've been X, Y, Z. And here he is now, you know, four years into his deal for, you know, into his NBA career. And you hope that if you're somebody who's the, you know, the general manager of this team, the owner of this team, that you're looking at a player who hasn't been corrupted by losing to where all of a sudden that fire that they may have once had that familiarity of winning and success has now gone and it's like, well, we lost a game. We've done this before. I know what this feels like. It sucks, but it is what it is. Like, no, like that's one of the things I always admired about DeMarcus Cousins and Ron Artest and people like that who like it really pains to lose a game. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, you don't, I know everyone handles adversity and success and failures differently. So it's, but you can see the people who clearly wear it. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's more painful to somebody who just keeps it professional and moves on. Someone like Harrison Barnes who can come out and, you know, be very eloquent in their communication about how they're feeling, how what's around the team. You know, he may not be sitting there punching a hole in the wall, uh, but, or sulking in his locker, but you know, he still feels it. So it's interesting to see the way people wear it, but I think there's also a fear that, Oh no, this person has become like numb to it, much like this fan base, which is like, here's another apathetic fan base who, uh, because of the season where they're just not coming to games anymore. It's like, okay, I mean, you don't even, it's just not even, it's not even fun. The joy has been sucked out of the building. Yeah, I get all of that, Sean. You know, like, it's not like Sean and I don't show up and work really hard all the time. Like, and the fact that we cover a team that, that sometimes doesn't do that, it does get under my skin on occasion. And, but also the fact that we show up all the time, like, it doesn't matter what market we're in, what team we're covering, we're still going to show up and, and do our jobs the best we can all the time. That's who we are. And like you expect it out of other people and you don't always get it. And you also don't always get like the, the frustration or the, like, like sometimes you feel like people don't care. And that's always the worst when you start to feel like there are a group of players or, you know, people within the organization that like have lost that, like the want to be better. And it, it's also why, you know, you see us write things or, or, you know, ask questions that feel uncomfortable sometimes. It's like, it's our job to demand better. So I, I don't fault Fox. Uh, like, I hope that, I hope that it's not too late because he's not the first player that we've seen come into Sacramento who loses that, that want to be great or that, that want to, to win every single night. Like, I don't like, I'm just not built that way. Like I, it doesn't matter what I, what I play, what I do. Like I always want to win. And I I've like played like board night with other, other couples and like, and someone asked me one time, like, why do you like want to win every single time? And I'm like, (laughs) because I played, why are we playing? Yeah. Yeah, If not, why are we playing? Like when I play cards, when it doesn't matter, like I just, I've always felt that like want to, 
to win. And then when you see it isn't there with someone, it's, it's usually pretty jarring, but after 12 years of doing this, I've seen it so many times that it's still like, it, it disgusts me. It makes me frustrated and angry, but I, I see it. I've seen it so many times that it doesn't surprise me anymore. And I, I don't want to see that go away from Fox. Like it's, it's a pretty weird high level conversation we're having, Sean. But it is, it is. And it goes, I mean, it goes beyond basketball, which is, which is always the fun part. And we start dealing with, you know, psyche and, and nuance and, and these, the, the character of players and personalities. So uh, I do like it. I think it is going to be interesting to navigate. You mentioned about the fans and just, you know, how, how some of the questions get even from the media. And I'll even point out for as long as the Kings were in this 15 year stretch, James, every time there's somebody new in the media in Sacramento, I always kind of, I always, I always laugh about media day, you know, especially considering in normal times. Okay. Take COVID out of the picture and just think of media day where everyone shows up. There's ev- everyone's around, everyone's around. Right. And then I always go, okay, let's see where you MFers are. And this is what I say to myself. I say, let's see where you are come December, see where you are come January 18th. Like as we record this podcast and see where you are three days into training camp for some of these people, just for some of these people, up. right. <laughs> and, and look, I know they all have bosses. So some of these, it's not, you know, I don't want to pretend yeah. like I'm calling people out, but I will say I'm at practice today and you would have been there if not having to be on the radio, but it was me, uh, two guys, one guy from Kings Herald and another guy who, and another guy from Brendan Kings Nunez Detroit. and Frankie Garcelli. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, two stations who sent camera people who aren't asking questions. They're just literally taking the questions. And that's always a tough, tough position to be in i feel i'm sensitive to those people because i work in television but i we very rarely will send at least in the sports side of things a photographer just to grab the sound of whatever press conference that we weren't asking anything and every time i do send a photographer in that position i make sure i f- give them a list of questions to ask so that they're able to participate um so i hate when i see that but that was it, James. I mean, that was it. There was no Sacramento Bee. There was no national media, which hasn't been the case in a long time. And I will go back to the Lakers game because I, I, you know, just this past week when we're when the Lakers were there, there might have been more national people and Lakers visiting media in the building than those who normally cover the Kings, which is a surprise because typically when LeBron is in town or the Lakers are in town, that draws a lot of the so-called media folks out of the woodwork. Oh, I got to go to the game tonight. You know, Lakers are in town. It's a hot ticket item, yada, yada, yada. Don't see LeBron, but not even this time. That didn't even say, that's what actually surprised me at that moment. So you do have people who are just literally not coming. They're choosing to put their attention on other elements of sports that don't even happen in their own market or tell some stories that most people wouldn't really care about. Like, you know, with all due respect, because we do them at our at, at ABC 10 as well. You know, we'll do a story on a Sacramento Republic player or a UFC fighter. Well, that's, that's kind of a bigger thing, but even like a high school athlete that we're just shining some attention on that might have a cool story that most people might relate to or find some sort of interesting nugget there. But the grand scheme of things, if you're doing a story on a high school, most people won't give a damn about it. Right. So except for that um, high school, except for that high school, maybe an alumni, again, you're just hoping that people see the story and think it's kind of, you know, it's good that there's a relatability there, but you don't have a f- passionate fan base like you do with the Kings. I can put something online and it can go everywhere. So I'm just drawing a p- picture about why some of the media attention may not be there, even, even for a team that is still relatively in, <laughs> in the thick of it, right. <laughs> Before yeah. the trade deadline comes and it, and you know, and I was actually, I'll mention her name. I was talking to Aileen Vossan last night. And she said, this year feels very much like the year that they got our test. I think we had talked about that as well in previous podcasts, because they're still in the thick of it, even though they're 10, 11 games, whatever it is under 500, they're still in there. And I remember everyone looked at Ron, like he had three heads on his shoulders when he said, no, we're going to come. We're going to make the playoffs. And we're all like, wait, what? (laughs) And they did squeeze me. Yeah. And they did. So that's what it kind of feels like. And maybe, maybe you're hoping, as I keep saying, Monty McNair saves this team from itself. And, you know, you bring in the Ben Simmons of the world or the Demonis Sabonis, these guys that are, the reports are out there, but maybe it's a move that, you know, hasn't been reported. Maybe it's a, because it oftentimes is, oftentimes it seems like where the smoke is, there's something else that goes on. And 
maybe it is something else and who knows maybe they make that push for the play in tournament or the playoffs or it, it, I don't even care about that to me I just feel like Monty McNair has to make a move that dramatically f- alters the course of this franchise because the path that they're on is not the path they should be dark it's dark, dark. and mysterious yeah. well actually it's not uh, even mysterious mysterious almost gives like oh th- this might work no we know that it's, it's a dead end it's a dead end no it leads it's, right it's, off a cliff <laughs> it's that commercial where the girl's like why don't we just get in the running car? And the guy goes, no, yeah. no, let's go hide behind that wall of chainsaws. <laughs> That's what this is. What are you crazy? <laughs> what are you crazy? Let's go hide behind all those chainsaws right there. Right. Like that's where we are. Uh, yeah. You know, Sean, like I covered, I covered the Kings for six years for, for NBC. Um, yeah, and Sean and I have this joke that as we go to walk out, uh, of the game every single night it they run this video of mark and uh katie christensen walking across the court where they literally talk about nbc and talk about this is the best coverage team they've ever had um and they're talking about the broadcast team which they could have said that but they don't say that they say coverage no. team um they sent one person to one game one time this season that's it okay so you go from six years of having someone at every single practice, every single game, every single everything to one person, one time. That's what we're kind of dealing with at this point. So it, it's different. The media is different. Everything is different. Um, and it's not because the media atmosphere has changed in the, on, in the globe. It's because this team can't get out of its own way. Yeah. And, and it's and, unfortunate. And, you're right, James. We didn't even mention NBC Sports. We didn't even mention the Athletic. Our, our dear friend Jason Jones is, oh, yeah. is on to a different, and they didn't replace him. And it, and it's nope. you know, to me as a subscriber, I would be pretty upset about that. As as a person who has somebody else's uh, username and password as a subscriber, Sean is okay. <laughs> I'll be just fine. <laughs> I love you, Sean. I love you. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay. It, it, this makes this is a perfect segue. Let's go to Tuesday over reactions. Oh God, here we go. Tuesday over reaction. Sean. <sighs> De'Aaron Fox is just a horrible person. He almost killed Garrison. <laughs> Garrison. Garrison. Mister Garrison. Uh, Garrison uh, Matthews. Yeah. Um, like. Was that a flagrant two? Uh, this seems like a strange Tuesday of a reaction, but uh, the Kings just lost to the Houston Rockets, who are like literally the worst team in the NBA. But let's go back to that game and why they did lose, which probably was because Fox got tossed with eight minutes left in the game. They're down by three at the point at, at that time. He went up for a for a monster block on someone who was trying to posterize him, mm-hmm. and uh, he did swing through. Um, but got mostly ball and shoved the ball into his face. Did you think that that was, that was legit or no? Uh, I'll answer it two ways because personally in the moment, I mean, yeah, it sure looked ugly. Yeah. I, even in the replay, slowing it down, even the angle that I shot myself and, and it, which is different, it's a different angle than what most camera angles in the arena have. I thought it was worthy of a flagrant flagrant two. I, you know, I didn't see it. I'd probably have ruled it a flagrant one because I still think he tried to make a play. I mean, he obviously got the ball. Um, however, there was some follow through there. And I will say, I, it, you know, as much as I actually feel like I might be wrong in this sense. And I think, I, I think you kind of side with me on this in terms of flagrant one, but I will say I asked, a, I asked about, five or six people around the league, including Aileen, who I spoke with the other night. And uh, she also thought that all, all, everyone I spoke to thought it was a flagrant too. People around the league and even she, she thought she thought it was absolutely worthy of a flagrant too. So um, yeah, it didn't surprise me. It really didn't surprise me, but I thought it was going to be a flagrant one. Yeah, right when I saw it, I thought flagrant too. Uh, when I saw the replay, the problem that Fox had was that in order to block a shot like that, when you're running backwards and then you're springing up and a guy's full head of steam, 
is that you have to actually swing to to actually you know push the ball backwards, which is what I thought he was trying to do. I did not think he was trying to injure Matthews. Um, well, and, and luckily people, he, he didn't get injured. Luckily. And I've had people tell me about the windup. And to me, I didn't know that it was so much of a windup to me because that's, what's so interesting about these plays, James. It's like, if you're calling it in the moment and someone said flagrant too, okay. But these are all reviewed. Like every yeah. one of these are reviewed. And it, to me, that's why I thought flagrant one, because like I, he, to me, he's trying to make a play on the basketball and it just unfortunately went off his face. Like it didn't, you know, but I, but I had people tell me, oh, here's the windup, here's the windup. And I've seen windups before that didn't feel like a windup to me, but you know, I'll, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to apologize for Fox. I just feel like I, it, I just didn't see it, but I could, see, I, I could see the call going both, both ways. I also yeah, think it's not, that, it's not egregious by the way. It's not something I'm going to die on this Hill and say, no, how dare they eject him? Alvin Gentry did because Alvin Gentry knew that once Fox was gone, that was an uphill climb. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, watching it back, like he got mostly ball, but the problem was when he came through his arm caught the underneath side of Garrison Matthews arm. So as he came through, he was almost spot on, but he got him like underneath and lifted him. And Mm -hmm. that's what knocked him off balance. So I I got the call. I still thought it was disappointing. Um, We, I was actually the poll reporter. We probably should have asked the question, (laughs) but like, you. (laughs) <laughs> like in all honesty, uh, like, like I'm now the pool reporter for about half the games, which is really odd, but people might not know what the pool reporters are, uh, which I, I just explained this on, on d and Casey. Um, so if you saw the Raiders game, right. This weekend and the Bengals th- uh, throw a touchdown, Joe Burrows throws a touchdown uh, into the back of the end zone, but he's stepping out of bounds. See if, the uh, side judge and the the like lead official don't really know what to do. Um, and then you go back and you listen to the audio and they actually blew a whistle before the ball was caught in the, in the back of the end zone. The ball should have, it should have been a dead ball. Like anytime the whistle blows, it's a dead ball in the NFL. Like it's non reviewable. It's a dead ball. The problem is the sound is not reviewable according to the officials, which I'm not sure is true or not, but following the game uh there clearly was a question about that play and for me i'll I'll just say like i'm not a razor raiders fan and and while i think it should not have been called the way it was called i'll say this the job of the of review and officiating and all that it's to get the play right and if they didn't allow that touchdown it was the wrong play it's just like how De'Aaron fox let the ball drop and they started the clock and he's like, hey, you didn't start the clock. So they stop the clock and then they give the a jump ball. And it costs, you know, the Kings any chance of winning the game. So like the spirit of the rule and the actual rule, the spirit is that the dude was wide open in the back of the end zone and no one had any chance to do anything differently. Um, and so I'm okay with the way that it ended up, but it brings you to the fact that there is a pool report. So after the game, there's one reporter that's the pool reporter and he goes and either meets in person with the officials or is on a zoom call now in the NBA where they literally call you're in the NBA. Like I would be on a zoom call and say, Hey, here's the, the official question that was asked by a media member. And I have to ask the exact question and then I can have one follow-up and in the NFL, they do the same thing. And they asked him, Hey, why was it called this way? And the official said, this is why it was called this way. And then they followed up and said, but the whistle was blown before. And he said, well, the whistle blows, not reviewable, all that stuff. Anyway, there's a pool report. We didn't do that for this game, which I don't know. Like, I I don't know how we triggered. I know as somebody, as somebody who's never been a pool reporter and I have seen how it works. Usually someone has to, you know, notify media relations there's not like a button we press that signals a yeah. light like a coach's challenge or anything like that and but, you have up until 30 minutes after the game yeah and and i was i was a little bit surprised but at the same time like it, it was a surprise that there was no at least explanation there but what's he gonna say yeah we we deem this the flagrant too because and, and it would have been like me or rule, you so. who, who asked there wouldn't have been anyone else we almost like earlier in the season when covington threw his mask I was 
the pool reporter on that day. And I thought I was going to have to go sit in and talk. Um, but everyone that was near the situation said, no, he clearly hit the official and, and it's non-reviewable. You're out. As soon as you throw something and hit the official, even if you didn't mean to, and it was out of frustration, you're and, out. Yeah. And, and especially in a situation like that, like it speaks for itself. Like there's video of you throwing the mask, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's over. I mean, it's over. Like it, it, you probably didn't mean to hit the official. I'll take you at your word, but the official doesn't need to explain why he threw you out. He threw you out because you threw your mask. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's like, come on, what are we doing? Yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the weird, one of the behind the scenes things uh, that there is something, there is a designated pool reporter for every game, uh, for every NBA game. It's usually, well, I think it's always a home, someone that's uh, that covers the team. That's the home team. And, um, like this in the past it, for a long time, it was Jason Jones, who was a pool reporter. Uh, but the last couple of years it's been, it was Jones and Anderson. And now it's me and Anderson, either me or Anderson cover every game. It seems like, uh, where one of us is a pool reporter and to date, I don't think that we've had any situation this year that has required it. Um, so just sort of a weird off the cuff behind the scene thing. That I figured but in I terms of the it. overreaction, yeah, I didn't. I didn't think it was a flagrant two. I'm fine yeah. that it was. I mean, honestly, and I think Kings fans should be, you know, especially if De'Aaron Fox remains on your team. How many times do we call this team soft? Like, I'm okay with it. I, I am honestly okay with it. Like, okay, it got you tossed. Yeah, you probably lost the game, um, but it shows that you're making strides in an area that, I mean, him jumping out of the way and making the quote unquote business decision. I had a more of a problem with that. So, I'm yeah, okay I with think. It. I think Buddy Heald got called for an and one earlier in the game where he literally didn't touch somebody and just got in the way. Mm -hmm. And he, he got called, even though there was no contact, it was a bad call. He got called for an and one on a breakaway for the, for the opposition. And so like, at least Fox did go up and challenge. I, I'm with you. I just, you know, it was pivotal. I, I think they should have taken more time to look at it and, and then come away with a more reasonable, was it intentional? Because I think that's what, the intent of a flag or two was it intentional and did you intend to to uh to like do bodily harm to the opposition and the answer is no right um all right so that's tuesday over reactions so Aaron fox is a horrible person that's it um <laughs> we've come to that conclusion and book it no um but it, it brings us to this the next topic i will say is, i will say i, I do oh. think it needs to i have to point one thing out and i just wanted to look it up real quick I remember the way that the definition is there's intent is never in there. They just talk about unnecessary and excessive contact for uh, a play, for a flagrant too. So it used to be written, I think back years ago, it used to be written about intent and it's hard to, you know, determine intent. So they made that unnecessary and excessive contact. So, okay. I get, I guess, I guess, yeah, I mean, someone could argue that, but I think he was making a play myself. I, I don't know. Yep. Um, okay, so that hurt the Kings. Uh, and the reason why it hurt the Kings as much as it did was because earlier that day, uh, Tyrese Halliburton became the 12th member of the Sacramento Kings to go out on health and safety protocols. Um, so we have left Harrison Barnes, Buddy Heald, Jemias Ramsey, Mo Harkless, and somehow Tristan Thompson has avoided <laughs> getting put out on health and safety protocols. Um, just start there for one sec. Tristan Thompson, oh gosh, was out on a non COVID related injury, uh, a non COVID related illness, but showed up at the game and was wearing like a white jumpsuit. He went over and at one point was hugging members of the Houston Rockets, like during the game. He also, like, I think during Fox's review, was over like hugging somebody on the other team. I don't know. Uh, he also was very like vocal on the court, jumping up and down, running all over the place. Shawnee looked pretty healthy. <laughs> Not to say that he would be playing. I mean, he could have, but uh, I, I don't know what to like. He told weird? us, James. He, yes, it was it was completely weird, weird because he's out with a non COVID illness. OK, was he hung over? I mean, like maybe he still had flu like symptoms or a cold or allergies like I get or whatever. Like, I don't know what it was, but 
he seemed fine. He didn't, he looked fine to where he didn't need to be on the report. And if you're having any illness, you shouldn't be around your team. So I don't know, maybe it was quite honestly, James, part of me thinks it was oversight. Like maybe they thought early in the morning, he wouldn't be there and he's just on the report. And all of a sudden he's like, no, I'm going to be there. And they're like, okay, great. And they just never removed him from the report. I, I don't know. It could be oversight. It was definitely weird, but I will say, uh, his energy on the bench is something that is a good thing. I think that he talked about it earlier in the season when he was talking to us about how if he's going to be on the bench, he's going to be the team's biggest cheerleader and biggest supporter. And I think some of that energy is really needed at times. And uh, to see him kind of be that guy now, does he need to walk out on the floor every time out? Does he need to, like you said, go over there and mix it up with the team? You could probably do that after the game like most people do. So I don't know. It it is a little bit odd, but no one has uh, told him not to do it, and certainly the officials haven't, you know, got on him for it. So it's it's just an interesting look. But again, if you're out with even an illness, like why are you around the team? Now, are we to a point though? Is he going to play for the Kings again? I'm going like to say yes. If you're a betting man, yes. you think he's going to play again? Yeah, and particularly because this is a rather long, like this is a five game road trip and over eleven days. And typically when you have stuff like this is, is, is a good time to where you're going to go a little bit deeper into the rotations and just to how Jekyll and Hyde, the, the bigs have been on this team. Um, I do feel like they'll go to him again. Eventually. I just don't know. You know, I don't know when that'll be. And I think, you know, I definitely think like he's going to be traded <laughs> by the, by the uh, deadline because of the expiring deal that he has. So yeah, I think, and plus, I think that, that he could probably help a couple teams out there. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see where he ends up for sure. If he's not traded, um, personally, possibly, possibly I think a, he's bought out the like a couple yeah. of days later. If he's not traded before the deadline, uh, just and that's not a knock on on Tristan. He actually hasn't been. He's been good with media. Like he's actually been, he's been excellent. Side. Yeah. He's been excellent. Yeah. Media, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, and this isn't against Tristan at all or, or who he is as a player. I think he can actually help other teams. Um, I think that there are teams out there that need backup bigs uh, going, going into the playoff season uh, and that, that he easily could step in and play 15 minutes tonight on a team that, that needed someone, uh, you know, like I always think Charlotte has no big men at all. Um and that doesn't make any sense. You have to actually have big men on your team because you run up against other teams that have giants. And, you know, I, I don't get how some teams don't have them. Uh, so I, I think, and when you buy a player out, um, sometimes you can negotiate. Sometimes they'll take a little bit less money. I doubt Tristan will, because I don't know that he's going to be in the league for much longer. And I don't think he's going to give away, say like a million dollars. But there is an opportunity that if he goes to a different team and signs a league minimum deal, you get a percentage of the money back. Um, so the Kings could save, I don't know, it might be a million bucks, might be 700,000, might be something, but that's better than not playing a guy the whole, all the way down the stretch if you don't think you're going to. His level of give a damn is something that I like because there's a lot of players that exude a level of give a damn that isn't as high as his. And I think there's, I think that's necessary. And I think he's been a good example for a lot of these players on how to, act professional from a basketball basketball standpoint. Um, I think it's been a, a, a good, I think it's been a good fit from that standpoint. However, um, you know, when it comes to the way he's contributed on the floor, it hasn't been there. It just frankly hasn't. And, but I do feel like professionally he's brought it for the most part since training camp and he's had a good, he's definitely had a good uh, impact on some of these players. Yeah. The give a damn meter. We need like a, a give a damn meter for Sean. Like, where is he at? Oh, it's uh, I my give a damn meter is very high. In fact, it's probably it's probably way higher than it should be, unfortunately, because there have been games where I've, you know, even from my little perch at, at our media seat where I'm looking around going, what the hell are we doing? And I'm just, and then my give a damn meter is very low at that point. I, I usually have a pretty high give a damn meter. I don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah. I would say, uh, you know, I know people don't like the fact that they lost to the Rockets. And <laughs> I would caution them and say, look, when you're playing a team twice in this, what I like to call a mini playoff series or, or a ser I say, I only call it a playoff series. It's the only time you ever really see it when you're playing a team like this back to like, that is really hard. It's hard in football. It's, it's, it's hard in almost any sport, but baseball, because 
you know, baseball, you're just used to playing a series of games. You're in that city, whatever. Football is tough because football, you're anytime you play a team twice in a season, if that team that lost usually comes back and wins, right? The, or the third time. Be, yeah. Or the it, third time, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Division this, rival, like what we saw, one of the worst Monday night games of all time. <laughs> Cardinals, Cardinals, Rams. That was just, but again, that's two teams that have played each other three times. Yeah. And then, like, and honestly, all you have to do in this game, when you're watching the, 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 the Kings and the, and the Rockets, just the, the games, even when Fox was in the game, the games themselves looked completely different. And I'm not talking about Christian Wood getting onto a hot start, getting in foul trouble in one game to where he can't really be that player that he was in the first quarter. Fast forward to Sunday, Christian Wood is a much more impactful player all the way through. Uh, he wasn't in foul trouble. So the game itself took on a life completely different than what you would have expected. And look just how effective Porter was uh, from one game to the next. You know, Friday was a lot different. And all of a sudden, Sunday, he was much better. So, um, yeah, the adjustments are made. I like it. I think it's good for especially for a team that hasn't been to the playoffs. And Buddy Heald was really good about talking about that on the first game on Friday against the Rockets that they won where he says, yeah, I've never been to the playoffs. And so having to prepare for a team again, it's a different type of challenge. And it's the type of challenge that a lot of good teams that are always in the playoffs and players who've played all throughout the playoffs for years and years and years, they take for granted because there's a whole other element of player, De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, these guys have never sniffed the playoffs. They have no idea what it's like. You know, that brings me uh, like to a random point. Um, it, it's also why when you get to, uh, okay, so the good teams, they play on national television. The Kings, they don't have national television. Has it been like three years since they've had a national televised game? Like there's ESPN games, but those are also broadcast locally uh, on NBC. So, so you're that's, talking about just like a TNT. So you're not TNT. talking NBA TV. No. ESPN, ESPN. Would, be a, would be a big deal, I still think. Because yeah. even TNT... Even if they're on TNT, you still have your locals. Um, no, but no, no. If, if you have TNT, there is no local ESPN and TNT. There's no local. I think we've okay. had one ESPN game uh, in the last couple of years. No TNT games for like at least three seasons that I can remember. Because you, you got to remember when you're on the broadcast, there's literally no broadcast. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no pregame. There's no postgame. You're not allowed. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's a different situation. Anyway, my point to this is that when you're in, when you play a bunch of those games, you understand that commercial breaks are like, like three minutes longer or two minutes longer. Right. So what you have is young teams, they have all this nervous energy and they're standing out on the court. Like, how come the game's not starting? How come the game's not starting? And you look over at the veteran team and, and there's Kevin Durant literally like laying back, just like they're just chilling. They know the drill, but mm -hmm. you end up burning all this nervous energy all the time and overthinking things. And like, because you're always waiting and you start like, it, it's not a good thing for young teams to get into or bad teams, teams that are just trying to learn. You get to the playoffs and all these veteran teams, they've been through this all the time where not only do you play each other all the time, but there's also these stupid TV time timeouts all the time. And it's way different. The whole game takes longer. Everything is elongated. And, and it's just a way different vibe. And it plays into the hands of a veteran team every single time. A right. group that's been there before. The Kings can't even get to that point where we have to worry about that. They can't even get a nationally televised game, let alone a, a playoff series where we would have to worry about this. But I will tell you that when they do, you'll feel it. You'll be like, oh, this is awkward and weird. And it is. <laughs> and it takes way too long. And then you'll see the Kings over like Buddy Hield will get like 80 shots up during that like timeout. It's like, man, just calm down. Nope. There just isn't there. it. Well, just sit there. You'll be just fine. sit there. Yeah. Just smile and wave. Um, yeah. So, and the funny thing is we started this conversation. It was about Tyrese Halliburton. Tyrese Halliburton is now in health and safety protocols. That means he's probably every other King has been about 10 days. Uh, like I think there Chemezi met to, I think is like the lone dude who like, like ducked in and like four days later, ducked back out. Besides that, Sean, this is not going to be pleasant for the Kings with, I mean, cause we're looking at basically a week from Wednesday is when he might be back. And by that point, you're what five, six games uh, into his absence. There's a good chance that that's the case. Um, 
it brings me to the is he the most irreplaceable king at this point? Ooh. Um wow. I wasn't ready for that one, James. It's either him think? or Harrison, right? Like well, and no, Harrison, so... Harrison hasn't played that well at all lately, but yeah, you've been yeah, look, you can't sustain success without Harrison, but you've been able to win and spite him a lot, even when he's on the court and you go, Where the hell's Harrison Barnes been? Um to me, I actually think I still think that probably goes back to Fox a little bit because uh while yes, Tyrese Halliburton has been able to fill the position admirably, um he, I still feel like you need that scoring punch from Fox. Um it, you know, I think we've talked about both Barnes and Fox needing to sustain a certain level of scoring success for this team to have any success or sustain it. Yep. And I feel Fox is the more irreplaceable because of the fact of Barnes being a guy who frequently gets lost anyway. So yeah, I'd, I'm, I think I'm leaning Fox a little bit more than, than Hallie than Halliburton right now. I, I don't, I don't I'm know if say, I believe it, but I'm leaning it that way. Yeah. I'm going to say it's Halliburton. That is just my own personal. I, when Fox missed, I think Fox missed uh, five games early. He missed five games in health and safety, four or five. Mm -hmm. I know that they coincided with Doug Christie taking over, mm -hmm. uh, but the first game Fox, they, they won. And then they went right. one and one and three without him um, with under, under Doug. And, and so I believe that, well, maybe it was only four games. I, I don't know. Fox missed four or five games. And, Halliburton held, held his own. His ability to shoot and his ability to create for others, I, there's just the Kings don't have someone else who does it. And what's going to be what's going to be fun to see is how Fox plays without Halliburton because now the ball's in his hands is something he's used to. He's not having to play off ball. That whole symbiotic. How how are they able to coexist? And that's what's going to be kind of interesting to see during this little stretch. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Um, I think we got a lot to figure out with this team. Um, I want to shout out uh, Terrence Davis, who I thought had, uh, like he he's been impactful um, with uh, with the change that's happened here with uh, the Kings being down Halliburton. Um, I, that that steal and dunk was probably one of the craziest plays that I've seen from a Kings player in a while. Uh, so I think that was that was solid. So, so was the shimmy and the miss. <laughs> the shimmy and the miss was. <laughs> Dear Lord. I mean, in when you think about it, in less than a span of a week, he had the most epic highlight you've seen that week. I mean, we made it our Toyota top play for ABC 10. And then <laughs> and I almost made it the shimmy because I was like, the audacity of this guy to do this and take as long as he... I was almost more pissed that he didn't just hoist it up quickly. Like he just stood there for what seemed like 15 seconds. The problem, Sean, it was like a super close game too. It was like 96 to 93 or, or 99 to 93. And if he hits Brutal. a shot at like, it really does put the game away. And he sits there and shimmies. You're like, oh man. And then bong bricks it. <laughs> bing uh, bong? Uh, like bing bong. Yeah, <laughs> no. Uh, and it, I mean, maybe the cold of ice, it cold as I should have played. Uh, yeah, uh, tragic Bronson. That's what that was like. Yeah, uh, it shocked in, you know, it's like, oh, come on, man. Oh, and I that. did it make it. I hope it made it. It should, or maybe we won't find out till this week. Yeah, we won't find out till this week, right? Yeah, it, it's possible. It's possible. Um, <laughs> it also, uh, but he, but you're right, Jay. I mean, he's 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 been fun. He's brought some, he's brought it. I mean, there's there's moments where he's a walking turnover. Um, but four steals the other night, he had three players with four steals. Um, that was crazy. Wasn't it? it? It really was. They had six. I think it was that game. They had 16, 16. but they had 12 among three players. Yeah. And it was buddy Davion and, and Terrence, yeah. um, Davion finally woke up out of his shell. So that was a good thing. Um, what do you think about him being, I mean, he's hunting for a shot. Like he's, I mean, it's so obvious right now. Well, I mean, he has to fight Shemezi Metu for who's hunting for a shot more. Like, <laughs> Shemezi Metu out there, big game hunting. Oh. I don't even know. Metu is like, 
you know, and I always want, I, like, I always. <laughs> I'm sorry I, that, that I, the dude was unconscious. He's like, I'm going to shoot it every time I touch the ball. Every time. F yeah. You all. And I always want to like, say we're having a, a Metu moment, but I, is that like inappropriate for like, because it, you know, Bro. I, I don't know. Like every, he just like, how is it that you just shot eight times in the first quarter and you're two of eight? Like, I don't get it. Like it's not. And to me, it's like, like they encourage him, but it's more in. So does the other team, Sean, the other <laughs> team know. encourages him as well, but it's an indictment on his teammates being that like, there's a, there's some moments where they can be selfless to a point. Yeah. Hey, Harrison Barnes, we need you to shoot the ball. Hey, Tyrese, we need you to shoot the ball. Uh, hey, Darren, we need you to shoot the ball. Even buddy where there's games where buddy is only going like eight shots from the field. I know there are some critics of Buddy that would love to see that. It's like, no, man, you got to shoot. What are you doing? It's the opponent's game plan. If people don't right. get that, it's, oh, let's make Shemezi Metu beat us. Oh, look, Shemezi Metu didn't beat us. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going swimmingly. <laughs> it's, it's science, folks. Like, what in the world is happening? Uh, yeah, so I, I don't want to beat up on, on Shemezi too much. Just like... Yeah. I don't want to beat up on Marvin too much either, but Marvin puts up 26 and 13 on Friday has like the biggest night of his season. First time he scored 20 points a season. First time he scored 20 in a long time. And then he's out on Sunday with a shoulder injury that they didn't even have time to put on the injury report because it happened so late. Like Sean, it, like, what do you got? I mean, and now he's yeah, not on the injury yeah. report again. Right now he's off and he didn't practice today in the scrimmage part of their practice not that that really means a whole lot but it it does make me tilt my head like a dog when they hear a weird noise <laughs> i'm just like wait a minute like okay shoulder injury okay soreness there i get it a lot of times you want to see a guy practice before they come back from a game he didn't practice but now he's not even on the injury like not even listed at all that's just it is weird i know we look and in fairness he's been battling that thumb lebron just killed his arms the other day and he had already um, been hurt before that Right. Yeah. He's, he's gone through wraps on, on this. I mean, it's, I remember watching him warm up before the, the game, he rattled off the, the, the double, double, the 26 and I, and he was shooting it well. And I was like, well, it's, it is his offhand. Like things are looking good. I don't know, man. Like maybe there's some residual effect from that hit on Le that LeBron had on him the other night. I don't know what it is. It's not a good look. It does feed the whole soft narrative, but you know, if it was one game, that's fine. Let's see. Let's see what he looks like coming out uh, for this for the stretch. I mean, you're going to go Pistons bucks and I mean, right, the bucks tip off this road trip. It's going to be, he's, and he's had, and he's played really well. Like that's the other thing. Like the guy's yeah. actually really, really played well. So I think um, so too, but these, this is the, as you mentioned, James, it, it, it almost feels like you're picking on the guy, but it's true. It's like, this is exactly what we're talking about through his time on the floor. And, and, you know, <laughs> it's all out of nowhere. It's just, you know, and then you'll ask him, oh, I'm going to be fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And it's like, when well, no, you just missed a game? So yeah, uh, you may have caught me like laugh for a sec and and it wasn't it just I thought could they put a hook on his hand? And just, you know, <laughs> like, 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 Cap like like Captain Hook like Yeah, yeah, like oh, is is or like uh is it Chubbs Peterson from uh Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was Happy like this Gilmore? thing, right? Oh no, that I'm thinking I'm actually thinking of uh of Kingpin where he had Kingpin. the two like hooks. <laughs> Either way, great movies Happy Gilmore and Kingpin. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, oh, could they put like the wooden hand on there and just like he doesn't use the left hand anyway. So I mean the right hand anyway. So <laughs> right hand, just yeah. leave him out there with the with the left and and have him go. Um, yeah, I'm hoping the Marvin's uh, better soon. He has played really well. And and you know, again, I, I think the team is gonna be cautious because he's another player that could be uh on a different roster by February 10th. Uh mm -hmm. that that's a very possible. Um, all right, Sean. So We've gotten through all of our Kings related uh, what's happening like with the games and the team and the players and all that stuff. But um, our friend, Sam Amick, like, like, first of all, like this team is it's, it's been a dumpster fire, but all of a sudden, like, you know, there's so much smoke coming out of this team at this point that it, it's gotta be something is happening. Something has to be happening at, at this point, right? Something is uh, happening somewhere. Something is happening somewhere. <laughs> Uh, according to our good friend, Sam Amick, the Kings are all in on, on Ben Simmons. They're probably willing to take on Tobias Harris. And if they're not, uh, if they don't land Ben Simmons, they're all in on DeMontis Sabonis. Okay. I'm in. They should be right. 
Yeah, I mean, they should be. So it just like, what would you, what's too much? What would you offer? Like, I, I know I, I put it out there. If I were the Kings GM um, and, and if I was a GM for a day, that was my Sunday musings. Uh, I'm offering, um, I'm offering Barnes. Uh, let's see, Barnes healed. I'm trading Bagley to Portland for uh, Robert Covington and sending him as part of the package, Tristan Thompson to balance out the salary. And um, I'm taking back uh, Tobias Harris. I'm taking back Ben Simmons. I'm taking back probably like Isaiah Joe and, uh, and maybe Springer just because you got to have the, the contracts, the number of contracts match. Uh, but then on top of that, um, I'm giving them two first round picks and we can to negotiate Philly. to Philly. We can yeah. negotiate on what exactly those two first round picks are. Uh, so that would be my offer. Uh, my, my son has brought the dogs in. All good. So, All good. Yeah. So if I you would hear say, the glitter clatter, that's what it is. I would say that, uh, if I'm Philly, I wouldn't feel like I'm getting enough. But and you're I saving that, 131 know, million over know, three years. I know. And it, no, oh, no, by the way, I don't know if anyone's looked at the standings lately. Like they're surging. Like Philly. They're, they're, yeah, Philly is surging without Ben Simmons. And you wonder just like, let's just pretend. And look, you all know, I think I'm, I'm, it's well, it's well known here where I feel about Ben Simmons. Like it's a risk worth taking. The Kings should, I totally agree. Him. So, and I'm so, agreeing with the, the same with Tobias Harris. It's a risk worth taking. Yeah. With, and, with and the I've, two of them. And I've been a Tobias Harris fan. Uh, yeah, he's overpaid for sure. But those are Grossly, the types of moves that yeah. Sacramento has to make. I think both players would be sensational in Sacramento. Um, but to the point of would I make this trade? I mean, look, the thing that I that, that that makes me wonder if I'm a general manager, you already have concerns about what happened seven months ago in the Eastern Conference Finals. I think it's seven months ago now. I might have to do my math. But we already know there. there's that. Now the guy has mental issues or mental things that, you know, mental health, like there's something there to where he's using that as the excuse to not have to show up to work and play for the team. I don't think anyone's buying it, but after meeting again with meaning, I don't think I, all of a sudden I feel like a lot of that goes away once he's shipped out of town and that the environment of the Sixers is contributing to the over is detrimental to his overall well being and mental health. Okay. Whatever. So Bottom line, he goes any any other city. That's probably not a concern anymore. But now, as a guy who's such a critical piece of their pie, so to speak, now they're just, I mean, I know they're still relatively middle of the pack in the East, but they've put some pretty interesting win streaks together in his absence. And you could argue that, that the more they win, that it kind of hurts a little bit of their of Ben Simmons' value. Even with that being said, if I'm Sacramento, I'm doing it. I think there might be some other teams on the, you know, like like Brooklyn, for example. You know, if Daryl Morey is all in on James Harden or if he's all in on Damian Lillard from Portland, if you're these other teams, you're kind of thinking like, okay, if I'm getting Ben Simmons, am I, do I have enough to give up for this guy? Yes, I have James Harden, but James Harden can opt out in Brooklyn. So you don't have to make that trade. You could, you know, you could facilitate a sign and trade, whatever you want to do, but he can opt out. So I wonder if he's killing his value to other teams is, is kind of what I'm getting at there. And I, I, and to me in Sacramento, you have to make the, you just have to make that decision. And I think to me, it's an easy decision to make. Now, granted, if I'm Philly, I feel like if you're shooting for the likes of James Harden, Damian Lillard, like these are the way you're trying to replace Ben Simmons. Sacramento just doesn't have enough, even if they are taking on Tobias Harris. Yeah, like I get what you're saying, but it always comes back to if you if you think you have a two million dollar house and all you can get is seven hundred fifty thousand, you got a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar house, right? Like it, it's been unrealistic what he's asked for this whole time. It's been actually it's borderline lunacy what he thinks right. that Ben Simmons is worth. Well, well, here on, flush your trade for a second, right? Put that trade aside. If I'm telling you, James, that to get Tobias Harris and Ben Simmons, it's going to cost you whatever package that includes Fox and two picks, two first round picks, are you in? If I'm Philly? Yeah. Or no, I'm saying if, if you're Sacramento. Sacramento. No, if you're Sacramento. No, 
realizing that that would probably mean buddy healed as well which is fine like whatever and but but the but the the piece the 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 core of it would be deer and fox and two first round picks yeah I, i'm not doing it i mean in in theory like you could be okay but at the same time what is the team that you're going to have left and i, I guess i guess maybe I, I would consider it but yeah to me two first round picks many... is, is a lot two first to round me... i mean these are kings first round picks these no, are i know they're huge philadelphia 76ers picks <laughs> right and to me it's all to me it's almost the there's not much i wouldn't do but it does get to the point of of just absurdity because that's why if I'm Monty McNair and I feel like this is one of the reasons why we haven't seen anything yet, because for one, Daryl Morey obviously is asking for a, uh, you know, he's King's got ransom. the big, he's got the big, he's got the whale here, you're, you know, so you're going to want something big, but I feel like Sacramento's best bet, even if you don't land Simmons is to definitely be a part of this deal to hopefully bring back a really nice core piece, something that you can add to this core. And that's where I think things get interesting. I think the, like the, the possibilities are very interesting at that, even if it's not Ben Simmons. Like, for example, okay, what if you're bringing on Tobias Harris without Ben Simmons? You know what I mean? Like those, some of those things. Now, granted, it's a womp womp, right? That's not what you want. That's not exactly what you that's want. That's called a bait and switch, which right. I believe that we have two teams out there that are trying to do the bait and switch. But to that point, James... If they covet Buddy Heald, for example, and you're not giving up a first round pick and you're not giving up De'Aaron Fox, but you're somehow involved in the deal, they could if, use. If I'm taking Tobias Harris back, right? I, if, and then let's say you, you do Tobias Harris for Buddy Heald and Tristan Thompson. Or I want, you, what about I Buddy Heald? What about Buddy Heald and Harrison? Something like that. Something Harrison That's Barnes and Bagley. It. No, I get it. I get it. But I think these are more some of the discussions that could be had. Yeah. I mean, if I'm taking back uh, that contract, then I'm the team that wants two first round picks. I'm the team that wants either Matisse Thibel or, or Tyrese Maxey. I'm not taking him back because mm -hmm. here at the end of the day, what Philly's trying to do, they're trying to free up enough cap space to sign James Harden. Right. And to which, to which I don't even necessarily think, for example, if I'm the Kings, while Tobias Harris is nice, what about Seth Curry? Like, obviously, if you're going to have Ben Simmons, you're going to need shooting around him. He's, he's, he's got a little bit of a bloated contract, but he's a pretty solid player. And he doesn't have a, we looked at, like I looked at, someone looked it up and then like said, oh no, you guys were off on that. Uh, uh, Seth Curry's contract's only like 8 million a year. Okay. It was, no, it, it, it was a, it was a four year 32. I think he's got okay. two years after this year. Uh, so no, he's totally reasonable. Like I would take Seth Curry back and a deal 100%, for sure. Yeah. But no, I'm not no taking, problem. I'm not giving De'Aaron Fox and taking on 131 million bucks of, of these other two dudes extra. I mean, I guess if you throw in Fox as opposed to one of the other players and it changes the math, but like, I'm, I'm not giving up everything to go get Tobias Harris at all. Like right. Tobias Harris is a, is an albatross contract that well, no it, one should take on unless right. you're getting Ben Simmons. Or Correct. Unless but I'm saying, and in my fantasy world of, of all of it would be if you're adding Tobias, but even without Simmons and you're part of a deal somehow, don't give up Fox. Like you obviously wouldn't give a Fox. Like no. you couldn't do that at all. But like, I could still see a way where Tobias Harris was on the, Tobias Harris was on the Kings that I'd be okay with. However, it would, you know, it can't involve your picks and it can't involve. It can't well, it wouldn't involve, involve your picks and it, or, and or to, or Ty, Tyrese Halliburton. It wouldn't involve Fox or Halliburton. And I wouldn't even give up Harrison Barnes in that situation. If they want to take, uh, you know, again, if, if they want to take Buddy Hill, they want to take Marvin Bagley and they want to take say Tristan Thompson, and they're going to give me back Thibel and, uh, and Tobias Harris. I would maybe consider it, but you literally are ruining your salary cap for years. I mean, mm -hmm. for two years, you're ruining your salary cap. The only way it really makes sense to take back Tobias Harris is if you are getting Ben Simmons. Right. And, and then it's like, what am I willing to give up? And so what I mean by bait and switch, I honestly think that they may be trying to do a bait and switch where they're like, okay, well, how about we just do 
Tobias, and, and we're going to hold on to Ben Simmons for a little while. Let's just do a deal here. And the Kings are going to be like, it, well, if they're stupid, they'll take on <laughs> Tobias Harris contract. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, yeah. if you're stupid, then you take on that contract. Because Well, I would say they, if Tobias Harris comes to Sacramento, he's instantly, I mean, he's, he's arguably the best player. Well, but not by much. I, and not I don't think much. he's, I don't think he's better than Fox and I don't know by how much he's a better player. And, and I mean, I know he's, a it's, I mean, it's close. It's not, yeah, it's more of, yeah. A, but again, you're taking on like a 29 year old guy who, uh, I'd much you know, rather have Tobias Harris than Harrison Barnes. Um, player yeah, for player yeah, yeah. for sure. No, I, I'm with you. I understand that. But at the same time, I, I'm not getting involved. If, if Ben Simmons isn't involved, I'm just walking away and saying, good luck. Yeah, like and that's I'm, what they that's what they should do unless there's pieces from other teams that you like more. Um, you know, because again, I still think attaching yourself to a deal that can make you better is it's paramount. Like it's paramount. You you know, whether yeah, you've got to get I, better, I think but at the end of the, I think at the end of the way. day, I think at the end of the day, do I think Ben Simmons will be a king? No, I don't. I hope so. I mean, I, I'm hoping so if I'm a King, you know, if you're a Kings fan, if you're part of this organization, you're probably hoping so. I, and I think they're not going to be able to, because I just don't think they're going to have the capital to give Philly. That's because, because I really feel honestly, like I think people are having this whole staring contest with Maury, but I really feel like he doesn't care about the, the, the trade deadline. Like, I feel like he can, he's, he's positioned himself well to get to the draft, to get to the off season and be able to make some sort of move at that point when the likelihood of grab, grabbing Dame Lillard might be better, when the likelihood of, you know, James Harden becoming, if he wants to opt out, becomes better. I The draft, I, I feel like there's there, there's a little bit more flexibility. I think he's looking at a lot of teams that might operate out of desperation, and a lot of people are looking at him like, oh, he's not going to, you're not going to have Ben Simmons. And I think he's like, oh, I haven't had Ben Simmons yet, and I'm already, I'm still a playoff team, and I'm surging right now. Like, I just don't think – in the East, it's not like anyone's really – like, you have the Bulls who played nice. Zach Levine's out now. You know, the Bucks are kind of figuring things out right now. They're down to, what, fourth or fifth, something like that. So, like, I, no one's really head and tails above anybody. The Heat, they're without Jimmy Butler, and yet they're still second or third right there. Uh, so, like I, like, I feel like he kind of likes his chances even without Simmons from a competitive nature in the East. Yeah, but he's not going to get through the East in the end. And, and so he's going to waste another year of Joel right. Embiid's contract. They've got Joel Embiid now going out and saying, I like what we've got going on here. That's a, a ruse. It, it's completely like more Daryl Morey based uh, propaganda that's been put out there, perpetrated on all of us. In a Joel. weird way, James, I'm kind of buying it. Like, I think there could be some, some better chemistry among the team like there's probably it's probably a happier place based on what they've been through it's possible okay so that's one bait and switch the second bait and switch of course <laughs> to me is indiana indiana is trying to get everyone to buy in she show me what you got for a sabonis deal and i'll give you miles turner and oh sorry miles turner broke his foot but he'll be fine right after the all-star break no i'm not big touching, man and foot problems i don't like it i'm not touching that deal even with the 10 foot pole uh, if you want to give up Sabonis, that's fine. What's what's the max you would give up for Sabonis? I'd give up both my first round picks. And and, and Harrison know. Barnes or Buddy Hield. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Probably. Um, I'd probably try to find a way to I mean they're not gonna give up Dorte, but I'd probably try to find a way to snag something else out of there i mean there's a lot of i think there's a lot they're of pieces, not giving pieces up there. Duarte. no they're I not, like no, Duarte. They're not. i do too they're not going to give up but i'm saying I'd, I'd probably try to try to finagle something else out of there i just don't know that there's much to be had i mean I, you know me i'm a karis levert fan i don't think you're going to be able to get karis um but i don't know it's not working out there this is the other thing too james like for as much as i like sabonis and i do i think you know i think he's fantastic it's like why has why has things gone absolutely to shit in Indiana? Like they're far too talented to be that bad. They're worse than the Kings. No, and they're I, more and they're more I, talented. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. Uh, no, I, I get it. I get it. And, and you know, like if I'm looking at that team, like like I would like Brogdon. Like, why is that not working? Why is that team bad? That's what I'm saying. Like it, you change coaches, and it it just hasn't gone good. It hasn't gone well. And they've been 
they've been in a lot of competitive games. Like that's one of the things, if you go and look at their margin of defeat, I guess pretty close. Like they're in a lot of games. They scored 133 points in regulation. Maybe it was 131. They lost 133, but uh, just, just, just on Monday on MLK day, they, they got beat. I think it was by the Clippers. I could be wrong, but it was, I mean, they're scoring 130 points and they, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I don't know why it's so bad there. Maybe, yeah. maybe they're maybe just the new coaching system flaws uh, with Carl. I don't know. Like it's <laughs> yeah, Carlisle's always been so hard on on point guards. Like again, if I'm if I'm going for Sabonis, like I, I would love I'm not it. trading Fox. I'm not trading Fox for him. No. Not that no. and again, I don't look at, you know, I'm not first team all Fox here, but I'm saying I just don't think I don't think it's worth, you know, moving moving off, even if you do have Tyrese as a capable fill, point guard ready to fill in. You know, I can see why Indiana would want De'Aaron, but yeah, I'm probably not trying to make that move. I if, I also if you, feel if you didn't give up a first, but you did, would you do Fox straight up Fox for Sabonis and Brogdon? And I know that sounds ridiculous. No, I'd think about it. I'd definitely think about it. That's 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 a that's a. I mean, Brogdon brings an attitude to your team. You've got a new facilitator with with. Demonis Sabonis. I know there's a lot of people there, out there who aren't a fan of Demonis Sabonis. I actually feel like it has more to do with their lack of his game altogether, um, as opposed to just like seeing what you see on a stat sheet. Um, because I think a lot of people just don't think he's a sexy name, but the guy's a very talented, talented basketball player. I'd love to have, I'd love to see him in Sacramento. I, I, I just, uh, to me, it just sucks because I was asked the other day, uh, on the radio, if I would, you know, if I, if I had my choice at Simmons and to Sabonis, who would I prioritize? And <laughs> to me, it's, it, uh, to me, it feels more like a ruse with Indiana. Like why would Indiana want to get rid of Sabonis? And I feel like Philly has to trade Simmons. And so therefore I'm going with Simmons. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. I think if one I also of them- feel like, by the way, like, there are other players that have been, you know, you've seen kind of bubbling to the surface a little bit. Like the Jeremy Grant thing is interesting, you know, not that that should take two first round picks, but um, obviously we'll see him here on Wednesday and that'll be kind of interesting. Kings will get up close and. Um, is he playing or is he I don't shoulder know. They haven't, jacked? they haven't, they haven't put out their injury report, but I'm hoping he plays. Yeah. I mean, I, I like Grant too, but um, I think he's only under contract for one season after this mm-hmm. year. And I also believe that, um, that he's slightly older than I thought. So, uh, yeah, let me, uh, just because we're here and we're discussing this really quick, um, Jeremy 27. Grant, 27, but he's almost 28. Yeah, he'll be 28 in March. Yeah, and then on top of that, um, his his money is, uh, he's owed $20.9 million next season, but then he's an unrestricted free agent. So you're basically doing a rental, and I'm not giving up a first round pick for rental. Um, like if we had a sign, like an extend and trade, which I'm not even sure you can do anymore, then sure. I'd give a first round pick. Or if I had a discussion and he was willing to lock into an extension, that's one thing. But I also think he only signed a two year deal with Detroit, which means he only has early bird rights. He doesn't have full bird rights. And so you're, you're looking at a player that you're not going to be able to do a lot with as far as financially. And to me, that's, that's really, really tough to deal with. Um, so like, I, I like him, but those things like devalue a player greatly, especially the injury history with all the other stuff. So he's interesting. Like, again, we just saw Christian Wood. Um, Christian Wood is more of a player that if everything else goes wrong, then I would really consider like right before the deadline, because I think you could have him for, you know, a protected first round pick maybe a little bit more than what you would have given up for Cam Reddish. So top 10 protected for this year and next. uh, Am am I, am I weird that I just look at Houston and go, I don't want any of them. I don't No, I don't blame you because they're just so undisciplined. (laughs) And someone told me they're like, they're like, Oh, what do you think about Kevin Porter? I was just like, "Ah." (laughs) Like, "Eh, no, 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 no. You know who I would take Tate. That, yeah. uh, Yeah. I mean, but I like his attitude. I like his attitude for sure. No, I I do. Okay, Sean, let's wrap up with the the business of basketball. That was a lot of business of basketball right there. Yeah, I've been talking for a long time today. So the (laughs) business of basketball. Um, 
this is it, it's going to be a short one and i think it's it's a fun one because uh we've covered this team we've been in the locker room for years um which is the sacramento kings player that freaked out the most that that lost his cool that became less of a player that um you saw where the nba tread that trade deadline the most they freaked out over it yeah and, and mm. whether they were getting traded or not god i feel like there's a super obvious answer that i'm not thinking of at the moment um there is i should have you go yeah you go let me think about some more the dude who i like he just wore it so badly and just could not play at all and freaked out. And then as soon as the trade deadline was over and gone with, he was like right back to the player he was before was Marcus Thornton. Oh, <laughs> I even yeah. thought like he molted, <laughs> like, Jeez. like, like he even would like get blotchy, like his hair would get blotchy. Like, he just, he, you remember how bad it was? He just like, uh, yeah, I do. Handle it? I, I do. And it's funny you mentioned the hair because, uh, yeah, he tried to grow it out at one point and it just didn't like cooperate. Yeah. And yeah, it, uh, that's not bad, man. I, I was actually, you know, it's kind of funny. I was actually thinking Fox in a way because like you can think about like the Januaries he's had, he's had some pretty epic Januaries and this one's a pretty good one right now. I mean, he's had some, you know, we're on our way to having some pretty decent games from him. And then like February comes and it's like, where it just, it's not the same. That's true. But he's, and never, I don't think it has anything has, has never been on the block. So, right. And it has, I, it probably has nothing to do with the trade deadline, but it has everything to do with, I want to make the all-star team. I want to make the all-star chatter a little bit more for whatever reason. He just finds a groove like in January where it and even late December around his birthday, where it's just, things just click. Um, yeah. You know, another guy kind of comes to mind. I remember, um, I, re I remember when, uh, give me a second here. I know this is dead air at the moment, but I remember the teams after the last playoff team and there were guys that kind of wore the trade deadline a little tough. Uh, I remember Derek Williams was, was one of those guys because he had been moved around so much that he was just anticipating another move. The Coke um, machine. The, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember guys that thought that they'd uh, come into, come into Sacramento and then they would be moved by the deadline and then they didn't happen and they were disappointed. You know, there, that certain things that happened there where they thought, Oh, I'm going to be a piece. that's going to be moved on. And Me it too. just, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say some names, but I might have to text you one. Um, but yeah, there's guys that, you know, um, I, 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 here's one I'll even say is Garrett Temple. I think Garrett Temple who had been moved around so much that he thought that he had put him positioned himself well to have some longevity. And even when he didn't get moved, he was a little bit disappointed, but he liked what was going on here and he knew he was playing for a nice deal, but that nice deal didn't really come. You know, he still ended up with a shortened sided deal. And uh, he's even a guy like him has always kind of puzzled me with the way the movement that he's had uh, both before and after the Kings has been kind of fun to pay attention. To. Yeah, because one of the best dudes you're ever going to run into, like one of the it's best sensational, one you're of great the best in your talkers, locker room. Yeah. just a, a spectacular human being through and through hard yeah. worker, everything a self-made man in the Mike, NBA. Mike Bibby had some hard times around the trade deadline. The the, 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 the later years of Mike, of Mike Bibby were, were really tough around the, the trade deadline. I never really thought it impacted his play. Um, but certainly in the way he, uh, when we would want to talk to him in, in the media, um, he had a hard time just kind of being the professional athlete, uh, at the time during the trade deadline. And then once the trade deadline passed and his name was kind of around the place, got him, trying to remember the years that that happened i think it was the year after yeah it was the probably the year before uh, our test landed here um he was always a little bit easier to deal with once the trade deadline passed yeah no i, I think it's an interesting discussion I, I talked about it today I, I remember that demarcus almost got traded to the lakers and it wasn't a trade deadline thing it was the off season and they reached out to him from the story i was told was they reached out to him and he was on vacation in Mexico. And I think they had called him a couple of times and he wouldn't pick up. 
so they sent uh his guy down uh to to be there and said hey they have a deal on the table with the lakers i think it was for the second overall pick and something else um i think it even might have been julius randall and like the second pick something like that uh it was a substantial deal that would have helped the kings um and they gave cousins the the choice they said do you want to stay here and figure things out and we'll talk extension and stuff like that. Or do you want to go to the Lakers and you can, we'll let you make the final decision right here. And, uh, he, he threw his phone in the pool is from what I knew. He, he was angry with the, the way that it went down and he threw his phone in the pool. And then he told his guy, go ahead and text him, tell him I'll stay and go get me a new phone. <laughs> that, that's at least the story I remember. Uh, from I hadn't Wayne heard Cousins. that story, but yeah, I know that there almost was, got traded. I know that he had uh, a lot of input on his trade on his destination at that point. Uh, yeah. And then he did not have, but, a, but he I, did not have any input after that. But I, I didn't know about the losing my phone in Mexico story. <laughs> yeah. There was a uh, phone in the pool. Cause uh, like it was, it was an intense situation. So, all right, Sean, do you have any final thoughts? No, I'm, I'm pretty spent, man. I'm pretty, I know you are uh, my final thoughts. Yes, I will. You know what? I saw somebody in our comments or maybe it was on Twitter. I don't remember where it was. They, uh, someone got a kick out of the movie review and they're like, Oh, I want to hear Sean's movie review for scream. So I'll give it to you. Cause I actually went and saw it. It's actually fantastic. Uh, it's, and you know, it's great. I didn't think I was going to say that. Uh, I still think the original's the best. So yeah. shout out there. Um, there's a couple nice little things they do for uh, in honor of Wes Craven, who was the original director, Nightmare on Elm Street director. Um, and yeah, man, it's going to hold you through all the way through the end. You may not love the ending. You may not, may not love certain elements of it. You might think it follows a pretty traditional pattern, but it hold it, man, it holds up pretty good, man. It really did. I was, I was, I was, uh, I liked it. I didn't love it, but I liked it. I think the first one's obviously better. So if you're into the horror uh, genre slasher films it's uh it's kind of fun is that five or six god i don't know five i think it's five yeah it's okay. the best one since the original and i actually thought some of the sequels were decent but the last two weren't so uh, yeah Scream two was all right I, I just feel like it got a little crazy but um yeah i, I think i think you'll enjoy it. and Mod- shout out modesto you get a mention in there oh interesting <laughs> I, I might have to uh i'm you know my oldest likes scary movies. So, um, yeah, I, we have all of the scream movies, so maybe I'll go back and watch a couple of them. Uh, I don't know if you need, to. all you need is the first, just watch the first one and you can fast forward to this and be fine. I think you'll, I think you'll be good. Okay. Yeah. It's been a little while since I've seen it, but not that long. So yeah, I, I've been, uh, binge watching just nonstop stuff. That's kind of the way it goes, but we were sitting with, uh, with our good friend, Sam Amick, and he brought up three movies in a row and this mm. never happens where uh, he brought up um, the Idris Elba cowboy movie. Uh, he brought up uh, the Matrix. Mm, I haven't and, seen that one yet. Oh, and the Benedict Cumberbatch movie, the cowboy movie. Benedict Cumberbatch, Benedict Cumberbatch bought a bank loan or whatever the <laughs> enunciation. Uh, Lena Washington taught me that. Uh, I have seen that. And it's, it's, you've got to be really into film, man. And I am, I I really liked it. Yeah. I really liked it. It's with, it's with Jesse Plemons and Benedict Cumberbatch and they are, it it is a, it's a mind F type movie. Okay. And it is, uh, you're yeah, I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix and it's called, um, something of the dog, uh, not hair of the dog, but something of the dog. Do you remember what it is? Yeah, it, it, I can't remember. Shadow of the Dog? No? I, I'll just tell you this. I started all three of those power, movies. The Power of the Dog. Power of the, the, power dog. Of the dog. Okay. I never stop watching movies. Like, when I start a movie, I always watch it. And if I do fall asleep in a movie, like, I'll go back and watch it, like, the next day. Those are three movies that, for some reason, I I got, like, halfway through, got distracted, and... It just was random. He was like, this one, this one. And, and I'm like, I literally stopped watching all three of them halfway through. Which the power is totally of the dog bizarre. is not for everyone. It, it is like, 
I, I kind of saw you, where it was going and I was like, oh, this is going to be awkward. And I don't think I want to keep watching. Um, no, so, even beyond that, I know what you're talking about. Even beyond that, like if you see it through, you're going to wonder what, what happened and everyone will have their theory as to what happened, but it's not that hard to figure out. Okay. So like, I, there's, I'll, there's I'll some of those movies where you have to like choose your own, um, like for example, I just watched this movie called um, Lost Daughter. It's on Netflix. It's with uh, Sophie, uh, Olivia Coleman, and it's it's really really good. It's a it's based off a book, um, and that one is like at the end you're like, okay, did this happen or did this happen? And it's because you have to kind of, it's a little bit of choose your own fate there. Which one happened? This one is a little bit like that, but I think it's done in a way to where it's supposed to mislead you. But no, it's it's pretty cut and dry what happened. So okay. Yeah. All right. I, I will. I, I'm, I'm it's so to great back. that we can do that without giving anything away. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, like even um, God, what's the, the Australian hitman TV show? Uh, Mr. <sighs> I'll have to come up with it for next show. I have no idea what you're talking um, about. Spectacular. Barry? It's not Barry. I know that. No, one. no, no. It's absolutely spectacular. No, it's, it's, uh, they had a movie in the, he had a movie in the 2000s that was like a full on independent film. Um, and then they, they made it into a, a series. And it, I think it was on FX and it, absolutely spectacular. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll come up with it for next, for next, uh, for Thursday. Um, all right, so that we've got movie reviews, we've got everything else. We get the business of basketball. We had we didn't um, talk about the SNL sketch. Oh man, I know Sean. I know we forgot about Sean's S. I thought it was funny, and I thought it, it had funny. nothing to do with Sacramento. Thank I, you. I mean, you know what? We hadn't talked about this, and I actually I heard some. Oh, it's their they're, oh, they're they're dog Sacramento, Sacramento Kings. They're killing like, the Kings. No, they're not. No. They just chose the Kings. That's all. Yeah, that could have been. That could have been. That could have been Memphis. It could have been anybody. They were just if, literally choosing a bad basketball team that they didn't even matter if they were bad it was yeah. literally like the, the word they could have gone all in and said like oh this laughing stock of the nba yada, yada, yada. or they, they could have gone like uh like cold as ice you know they could have done right <laughs> you know right ice cold like they could have played that into it and made it much more pointed uh like but i thought it was funny i thought it was funny and i didn't think it was like it was very intentional that it was like we live in COVID times. And then what happens right. the next morning, uh, Tyrese Halliburton out in <laughs> right. health and yeah. safety. Yeah. I mean, the 12th. And Kings everyone player. was making the, making the joke. Here comes Dougie McDermott or what, not Doug McDermott, but Dougie Mc, whatever the hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I can't remember his name at this point. I, I did yeah. ask in pregame uh, who he was and, and whether we were going to see him. That's I awesome. asked Alvin Gentry. Um, and he probably didn't had no idea. Oh no, he was, left. He 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 knew. I mean, I, I will say this too, the franchise, because uh, you mentioned cold as ice, and I know I had to report that the other day. Cooler heads may have prevailed in the NBA. I haven't <gasps> reported it yet, but there could be. There might as be cold. Yeah, we might yeah. have a return. I don't know if it'll be the way <sighs> we we knew it before, but. Yeah, I enjoyed we, it. We might have some things. I do remember, you know, even after there was some, I. I the day after I reported it, I had some people telling me that cooler heads may have prevailed. They saw some of the, re, you know, even the league had seen some reaction. And, and uh, I, I, I remember the, the game night staff going out of their way to show it up there and say discontinued. <laughs> so yeah. uh, a lot of fun was had good. in the arena. I think it's good stuff. I think it's good stuff. Yeah. All right. So I think Sean, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kings beat podcast. Uh, make sure to give us a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the King's Beat. Make sure to get a premium subscription. When you're all done subscribing to that, you can go to iTunes and subscribe there and give us positive comments. By the time you're done, it'll be Thursday and we'll have another show. How about that? Um, and and I think, uh, you know, we got the Detroit Pistons coming into town on Wednesday. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to check out Kate Cunningham. No relation. Uh, uh, wait, oh yeah, there we go. Uh, <laughs> it's a chance for us to wave hi to Corey Joseph, uh, and say, Hey, <laughs> to our Canadian so, friend. Sorry. It didn't work out. Yeah. Sorry. It didn't work out. Is that uh, a nice little season though. Yeah. I, I like Corey Joseph. Team sucks, he's, but he's, he's doing all right. Yeah. Corey is such a nice man. Uh, so I'm, uh, good to see him and, uh, you know, that 
that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat Podcast. So for Sean Cunningham uh, from ABC10, I am James Ham. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday.